This is, this is, this is. All right, today's a very special day, a very special day. So take note, June 3rd, 2024. It's a Monday. Happy birthday, Yuri. Yuri really our drummer, MXPX drummer, legend, legendary mate if you're in Australia, uh, amazing human, the funniest guy he knows. He tells all the best jokes, uh, has the best stories. Go wish Yuri a happy birthday on his Facebook wall. Follow him on Instagram. Say what's up. Uh, he would love that. Um, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing some shows in at the end of the month, actually June twenty eighth, twenty ninth, in Bremerton, Washington. That's our hometown at the Admiral Theater. MX Peaks and the Ataris. Both nights are sold out. Happened really quickly. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, but if you're there, shout out happy late birthday, Yuri. And um, uh, he would love that, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be playing the next night, June 30th. That's that's uh, a Sunday. We're going to be playing in Portland, Oregon with No Effects for their last show in Portland. Um, and then we're going to be playing their last show in Denver in July. And then their last show, period, ever. We're going to be doing their last show weekend in San Pedro, California in October of this year. So... Uh, a lot of a lot of things we haven't announced yet as well coming up. We're we're, we're still planning some shows. MXPeaks.com for, of course, show links, tickets, new merch. We have merch coming out this summer. We'll have merch at all the shows. Uh, we have a new album out with a bunch of vinyl variants. Find a way home. If you haven't already listened to it, please add it to your music library. Join the MXPX Challenge where you go and you get the playlist and you listen to it every day. It's great. Um, if you want to be part of the podcast, I would encourage you to call in. Just figure out something really fun, really interesting to talk about. Maybe you have a question. It doesn't have to be about MXPX. It, it absolutely can be. It can be about punk rock or anything like that. Um, I do know the most about songwriting and, and recording and touring and traveling. But it could be about anything. I encourage you guys just come up with a really interesting topic Call in. The number is 360-830-6660. All right. Let's get to my guest. He uh, got into the whole metal scene as a young, young kid. He then got into being a barber, kind of discovered that he was really good at haircuts and became this celebrity barber, a multi-barbershop owner at a very young age. He, he ended up being a part of a reality TV show. He's uh, originally from the suburbs of, of Montreal, so he's a Quebecan or a Quebecian. I don't know how, how you say that exactly. But the thing I love most about, about this guy is he, he put out, he's now an author, and we're going to talk about his book called Dadass, and he put it out DIY. He, he did it himself. He didn't get a publisher. He's kind of doing things outside the system, and it's very punk rock, and I love that about him. Uh, Another thing I love the most maybe about reading through his book is over and over, just subtly, he would kind of make fun of vegans. Not, I don't care if you're a vegan, be a vegan. It's great. But it's just, there was just something funny about it. There was nothing about the, the book about vegans, but just a little thing in there, here and there. I just kept cracking up because it's just kind of fun to make fun of vegans. All right. Without any further ado, let's get him on. Um, he's not only a businessman, but a teacher teaches haircuts and and uh well you'll hear about it on the on the on the podcast but maybe i'm gonna become a barber we'll see let me know awesome awesome ladies and gentlemen we have a very special guest today oliver colt and you're a a, a metal barber slash celebrity now author of yeah one of the what what the crudest i've got your book right here the, the most raw and vulgar parenting book ever written so uh, yeah, <laughs> well, <welcome>. yeah, just <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's like I I, I had to have down the cover because I was just like, again, I needed to narrow the amount of people you know that could read the book and enjoy it because I know some people are just like prudes. Absolutely. I think this book this book ain't for you because it's not your average parenting book. Well, we'll get into a lot of these stories, but let's talk about the book for a second. And and yeah. it's out. When is it coming out? This is June third so, well, when this podcast. We're June, out. yeah. So um, June third that this is coming out. So because we're, we're filming a few days earlier, so it's coming. Out, it came out yesterday. Then it's June second. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah. Cool. I think people pretty much understand. I have to record these a couple of days in advance. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fresh. It's fresh <laughs> off the press. This thing's out right yep. now. I've been yep. reading this book, um, dude. 
you, what, what you were saying about you had to make sure that your audience sort of like it's a, it's a very niche audience, a very yeah. a, a certain type of audience that might really enjoy this book. And whatever yeah. you did at first, I was like, is this guy full of shit? You know? And then I just kept <laughs> reading and I was like, well, even if he is, he put some time and effort into this because I really started connecting with the stories and, and really enjoying yeah. what you had to say, not about all the craziness necessarily even, but just how you went on this journey and came came to here, you know, and, and then you're writing it. Yeah. I, I wonder how you wrote. Um, is this your first book? I mean, can can we can we start with that? Yeah, so it's my first like official grown up book. I've written a um, kids book before. So um because I have two young boys and for the uh, since the since my first one was like maybe two or three, he kept asking me to come up with stories instead of reading him books um at night so he would just be like you know like come up uh, a different story a different story every night and it was a couple that i saw were like a big hit so like i would just write them down and it's kids stories so pretty easy put them on paper a lot of them i printed and i have them at home it's just like a one copy thing for my kids um one i published before but like never wrote something um as interesting and like for that i would personally read you know so like that ass was the first time that i was like okay now this is my leap into real authoring like i'm going to be an author now this is this i need to write this book and it needs to be fire and uh yeah so it was just like a first time trying trial and error but it came so um naturally that that that's why I'm, now I'm like, dude, this I can't be doing anything else really. I'm like, I have to keep writing books. Like, this one was just great, fun, so fun to write, and I feel that it it kind of shows in the writing too that it's like natural because all those stories are true. All the stories are true. Yeah, it reads almost like an autobiography. Like it's a story mm -hmm. of your life in in a way that goes into these stories of your life, helping you figure out something about now, something about being a dad, being a husband, being a human. And uh, mm -hmm. the book's dad ass, in case anybody, anybody's watching on YouTube. Uh, the cover is a little hard to walk around, <laughs> with <Yeah>. the pool, <laughs> walk around the pool with. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like just, you know, I like covers with a big ass on it, but it's not, I mean, yeah. you gotta look at the cover. It's, it's tasteful. It's, you have a nice bubble butt. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's like, um, so my friend Andy, shout out to Andy. He's, uh, he's doing comics for a living, obviously, as you can tell with the style of the cover. He's uh -huh. done work for DC. He's done work for so many big companies. And now he has this uh, comic book series that he came up with called uh, Mother Trucker. And it's like wrestling, this this superhero wrestler, female lead character, super badass. It's sick, sick, sick. And he has this way of drawing that that I've always been like, like, I wish I had more art of him in my house. So like when it came down to the cover, I was like, even though it's more like a parenting, self-help biography type book, I was like, it needs to be cartoonish and it needs to be by this guy just because I wanted to collaborate with as many people as I loved as possible in the book. So yeah, I feel like it stands out definitely in the category. It stands out. <laughs> so let's talk, you know, we'll talk more about the book, but I want to talk about you. You know, people might notice mm -hmm. you have an accent. Um, yeah. French Canadian. And, yeah. um, so where are you living now though? Because you've been all over the place. Yeah. now I live in Mexico. So I live, um, in the Caribbean region of Mexico. So I'm like in between Tulum and Playa del Carmen. So I live by the beach. I have the beach in my front yard and backyard is jungle. So I'm like right in between both. Um, we moved here in 2019 ish, um, 2020, maybe beginning of 2020. And I've been here since, but I'm from originally from the suburbs of Montreal in uh, Canada. Wow, that's quite a change. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> like, no more snow. Like, even my youngest son, he's been pretty much like we call him the little Mexican because he's pretty much Mexican. Like, he's was he was born in Canada, but he moved here four months old, and he's never really spent more than like a few weeks in Canada at a time. So every time we watch Christmas movies during Christmas time, he's like. Why is there no snow here? Like I've never seen snow. I, like he doesn't like. I'm like you've seen snow, but you were like four months old. But like you, he doesn't really like associate now Christmas with snow and Santa Claus. For him, it's just in movies and it's not real. And I'm like, yeah, like I, it's not part of your reality. That's for sure. That's wild. So what, dude? What brought you all the way down to Mexico? Because I'm 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 intrigued. I love. We were MX Peaks was just in Mexico a few months ago. 
great times. Nice. Uh, we, in Mexico yeah. City, you know, we didn't do a full tour, so we yeah. didn't probably make your town. But um, no. what? How the hell do you end up in Mexico? It's the it. It was all starting with obviously like when the COVID hit in Canada, like it, shit became weird real quick, um, especially with kids. And I was I just wasn't down with everything that was going on. I feel like. Uh, like we, I talk a lot about it in the book, in the chapter called "Fuck the System." I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm against so many things. Uh, like, like I will never allow a government to tell me what to do. That's that's the one thing. No matter where I live in the world, and Mexico is one of these places where like there's so much corruption, but it's cartel corruption, <laughs> and it's not hidden. And I'm all about corruption. I don't give a shit like who you give money to, but like let us know, you know, like it, it just, it, you know, it just needs to be in your face and then I'll respect it. But like suit and tie people doing corruption and, and hidden and trying to, to hide everything for decades. And then the population suffers from it, like in Canada, like in the States, like in Europe, I said, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. So I'd rather be in a country that's obviously run by the cartel, but the rules are clear and it is what it is. And you accept it or you don't. And for me, it just, it fit my lifestyle a lot more. There's a lot more freedom. Yeah, a lot of people talk about like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm complaining about the government, but they'll never do anything about it. So you actually were like, yeah. let's just do this. Why not? You can yeah, always move well, back to Montreal if you need to. I could. I could if I wanted to. But technically, like I sold we sold our house. I don't have a bank account in Canada anymore. Like we like we have like nothing there. Whoa. And uh, every, okay. everything's here. Like we bought a bunch of land here. I have my house here. So for now. It's a. Like, I know it will be a good like four or five years here for sure, um, and we'll see. But going back to Canada, I don't think it's going to happen. Right, right, dude. I that's the you know I read I read most of the book. I got like halfway through and and I skipped a couple ch chapters. Like right after not as do as I say, not as I do. I skipped. Well, I guess I skipped. Fuck the system, all the way till the end because I was like I was like okay hippie daddy okay I get I get what that probably is cool cool breath work yeah. stuff. Med meditation. Yeah. Uh, but then yeah. I went to the end, which was, you know, I just wanted to just like have an overview of the book. Uh, yeah. Go for one more round that the end. So fuck the system was like, okay, what is this about? So I didn't quite understand, yeah. understand yeah. it yet. So, uh, I mean, that's the thing is like, honestly, it's about paying attention. It's about paying attention to things that matter in your life, you know, and, and, and if it matters mm -hmm. to you and you go out and you move to Mexico Man, I have so much respect for that. That's that's great. Thank you. You know, uh, yeah. For for us, it was values for the kids. You know, like we, we if I, if it was just me and my wife, we would probably be world travelers. You know, like I'm still young, I'm in shape, I can do whatever I want. Like if I didn't have kids, we would be like I would not buy anything anywhere. I would spend six months here, six months there. Like I would just move all around the world until, until whatever. You know, but um, Mexico with kids, you have to have a grounding space you know like they need to feel grounded and have roots somewhere mm -hmm. and the only place that felt like we we considered costa rica um but homeschooling isn't legal in costa rica which was surprising and i really wanted to part-time homeschool my kids for me it was 100 percent sure as we left canada that there would be no way my kids would be in a school system they had to be in an off-grid system where we are more involved in the education and in everything that they get, you know, that they learn and get fed up, like fed at school from the teachers. Yeah. So um, we have that here, you know, so which, which is like perfect for me. We homeschool our kids too. Uh, what's your kind oh, of yeah. like average day look like? Um, so, so we're super lucky because we found this small community. It's mostly expats, like, for, but from everywhere, Americans, Australians, a lot of Russians. Um, and we're, there were about 40 kids um, who go to the same school in the jungle. It's about five minutes away. I mean, the kids do school outside and like there's no running water or electricity. So they have like a palapa and everything. Um, but they're there from nine to like one. So every morning, there's no rush. We have our routine in the morning. Like my youngest one who's four, he does ice baths in the morning. So like we have like that, <laughs> that settling down. We wake up with the sun, take our time. We do our things. We're not rushed. Like I didn't want to have a lifestyle that was rushed. They do. So they do a little bit of school, like Montessori type, Waldorf type school over there from, um, yeah, nine to one. Then I pick them up. We usually do like activities um, that are somewhat in the curriculum of, of a Waldorf school program and uh, for like about an hour or two. And that's it. 
then after that's playtime, do we we do activities? We go to the beach. We go to the pool. We do, you know, yeah. just spend time together outside. That's it. We and I I find myself being able to um, teach them a lot more that way than I wouldn't that would have they would be in school and I would see them at like five or six p.m. You know. Yeah, homeschooling has really sh- opened my eyes to like my own experiences because I went to normal school here in the states mm-hmm. and wow, the amount of time we're just sitting there daydreaming about whatever or just messing around like there's just so much wasted time i mean maybe not all of it's wasted it's a different kind of life you know that we lived back then but yeah yeah, but now it's like wow what would life have even been like if i had homeschooled like myself you know like yeah yeah not homeschooled myself taught myself everything (laughs) yeah (laughs) uh, no no that's wild, oh, man. Sure. That is wild. I love the homeschooling now, thing. How old are your kids? How old are your kids? My kids are seven and eleven, or maybe okay, ten. So she ten? No, she's eleven now. Seven and okay, eleven. So, so I have a seven and a four, so it's like kind of like with the seven at the same place. Yeah, it's a it's it's a fun age to to homeschool at seven, starting seven because they're. I feel my son is super curious about learning. And when you homeschool, you usually try to find a way to make it fun. Like learning is more play learning. And by play learning, I feel like he's so much smarter than I was at seven. I'm like, I was like, if I compare myself to him and I was in the school system, in a private school system uh, as a seven year old. And I'm like, I nah, like it's the same, the same, you know, like he's a lot smarter, a lot like more conscious. He's, 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 he's topping me for sure. Yeah, I found my son to be my seven year old. He's so much he like has existential questions and thoughts and and big (laughs) world like, what's it going to be like, you know, this, that. And I'm just like, I was never thinking about anything that deep when I was a kid. I was just like, G.I. Joe and and this and that. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Pokemon and whatever. It's wild. I, I just I can't even imagine what it must be like for kids to grow up today with all the technology, with all the screens and and just just all these people constantly, you know, ah, 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 ah. I mean, I know yeah. it's crazy for yeah. me as an, as an adult. Yeah. I imagine their little brains and we, I saw it a lot with, I have friends in, in Canada who have kids the same age as mine. And they were like, Oh, like they sent me like the list of school supplies they had to buy for that first year, like at seven, you know, it's like a first year of elementary school. And, uh, there was laptop slash iPad. And I was like, w- Why? Like, why does your child, their seven-year-old, needs to be in front of a screen at school? And then they said, oh, it's because they have this thing where they learn how to do emails and they communicate in the morning. They have to send a good morning email to the teacher. I'm like, teacher's in front of them, dude. Like, <laughs> communication, you know, like, like, like I don't know, like, the, like, it's something we're losing even, like, we're trying to, like, make our kids into little robots at seven, like, not even have, like, that, that physical, like, Thing of saying hi to your teacher, like giving a hug or like bring a fucking apple or some shit. And like, well, what's happening? You know, like you're trying to disconnect children and education. It's just so weird. It is weird. Who knows what's what it's going to be like in the future? But let's go to the past. Let's go. I want to talk about your metal days because that was yeah. fun for me as a band guy. I was like, oh, I wonder what bands, you know, thinking about if you came from Montreal area, I was like, okay, we know like uh, Simple Plan guys, of course. And then they came up. Yeah you know, in the scene before they even started that band. And um, we, we played uh, Snow Jam Festival uh, in Montreal. That? It, it's in Montreal. And it was, okay. um, it was like Satanic Surfers and all these like kind of like okay, punk, yeah, punk yeah, yeah. bands. And uh, that was like our first time to Montreal. And this, this, nice. this guy picks us up in, a, in this old van. And uh, we we're just like little kids. You know, it was a wild, wild experience. But... Tell me about metal. Tell me about your scene. Like, how was it for you guys? Yeah, so I I, I really came into like with I'm born in '93, so um, when like I grow grew up as a like young teenager listening to like Slipknot and all the 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 classic like big metal bands at the time, you know, like Linkin Park, Slipknot, like more new metal mm-hmm. than anything. And um, then I really converged real fast into the metalcore scene that was like growing like like those as la dying um uh, like august burns red all these metalcore bands were like really popping up and they were accessible for us as teenagers you know i, I remember being like 14 15 and i would go to 
small venues in Montreal to see shows, and it would be August Burns or As I Dying, and were like 150 people in in the room. So like it like it really like there was a big community of metalcore kids that we would all know each other, and everybody would be super young, like between like 14 and like 19 tops at that time so i I grew with these people because the bands were also young all the guys were like 18 19 playing in these bands like 20 max so um then when i became a little bit older and i was 6 15 16 when i decided that i really wanted to be more involved in the music industry and i didn't really have that much talent as a musician you know i was like i can I can play bass in like a really basic hardcore band or something, but I can't play anything too technical. So I was like, I got to just find a way to get involved in a music scene because I'm passionate by it. So I started booking bands and it was so um, more accessible back then to start that kind of career because online with my space and everything was just, it was still at the birth of what it is now it's it's insane now like you have a band you go on social media you, there's there's so many ways to reach people that you can like add that as a if you want to become a promoter or like a booking agent it's impossible to make your way to a band but back then i would just i i prepare like a nice logo build myself a little web page professional email address like would send a simple template like hey i'm starting out as a booking agent in canada i want to bring your band to Canada, I'll book like a small four or five day run and I would just do like say like Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto and then Windsor and then boom, go out by Detroit and I would do like something like that and I, re- I probably sent like two, three hundred emails and I ended up booking from like late 15 years old to 17, 18. I probably booked like 30, 40 tours for American bands like all across and then I started tour managing on these tours because I just want to get the fuck out of my house. So I would be like, okay, like I'm, I'm, I'm booking. And then at no fees, no extra fees, I'll tour manage the tour. You just have to let me in the bus. So like I would jump in the bus, start tour managing. And that's how I made like a bunch of contact. And I did that until I was like 19, like uh, until I started like cutting hair. But I and, did the tour managing. Yeah. And your tour managing yeah. led to cutting hair. Like everybody's on tour. They yeah. get haircuts. They have no money. Yeah. Like, I'll yeah. do it. Well, the the first times I started cutting hair on tour, I was actually playing in a band. That's I was tour managing this band from uh, from New York called Doctor Acula. So it's like um, party core. Okay, you know? cool. <laughs> so um, I was playing bass with them because they they had like a huge like you know like those those classic um, like young bands where they get into fights on every single tour and then like the bassist just dropped out middle of the tour was like fuck you guys i'm leaving blah blah, blah. like over like probably some petty ass shit i just don't remember no one ever respects and, uh, the bass player yeah no, that's it <laughs> and then he bounced and the guys were like dude you play bass i was like yeah They're like okay so just fill in for the rest of the tour so i did and uh wasn't hard to learn the songs you know i'm talking breakdown so like easy like if you know the tempo and the the rhythm you're good you know yeah so uh i would just like lower the volume anyways on my (laughs) amp i'd be like fuck it (laughs) you know like uh, everything's good (laughs) as long as i move a lot on stage it looks like there's a bassist playing i'm good you know so um i did i did a few shows like that and then after that i i did another tour with them as their bass player and that's when i started cutting hair because um joining the band i was now getting the uh, per diem from the band, I w- which was five bucks a day. So I was like, okay, shit. Now we have I have five bucks a day. I went from making like a tour manager salary of like a little bit more than that because I would just pocket the money to not touring a tour that I didn't book, and I'm getting five bucks a day. Like great. So <laughs> I didn't have money for cuts. No one had money for cuts. So we picked up a clipper and a flying J, cut each other's hair, and uh, everybody was like, "Dude, like you're you're the best one at it." I was like, "Okay, sure." So I kept it, and uh, I just bought it back from the other guys. I gave everybody like two bu- two bucks, and I was like, "Okay, now this is my clipper." And uh, from that point on, every tour with tour manager, I started cutting hair and making some extra cash on tour cutting hair. That's a hell of a story, man. Like, could I become a barber like just right now? Pretty sure you could. <laughs> So it, it, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing of like, especially when I started, barbering wasn't what it is now. And now it's a huge scene. Like I'm doing like, but when I left the barbering industry, I was kind of like at the, the top of it in Canada. I would do shows and get paid like thousands and thousands of dollars per day just to be present at the show and judge people's haircuts. Yeah. Can, and, can, you know, can we talk a little yeah, bit about it? comment. Yeah. I, well, I just started to interrupt. I was just like, a lot of people, including myself, don't really know a lot about that world. 
Like, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, what? Like, what do you do? So please explain. Like, you get paid and you, of of course, you get paid to cut hair, but you're doing contests. What is that like? What What is all that? Yes. So it started pretty much when when I got into the barbering industry. It it was kind of like at the you know when tattooing became big and then Ink Master came on TV and everything. So so there was a moment where like tattoo tattoo uh, t- tattoo artists and tattoo shops were making like barely enough to like just like eat and do their shit and whatever drink and whatever. And then it became popular and then everybody was a tattoo artist. Mm-hmm. Everybody wanted to be especially a traditional tattoo artist a neo trad. And then people would want to go on Ink Master and then boom TV and then everything started. So when I joined like started barbering full time, I was at the beginning of that stage. So I, I got into barbering and then six months later, it started getting like real big all across North America. And then shows started popping up because there, there's always been like industry shows for hairstylists where they usually have like uh, education on stage and there's a bunch of like distributors around and people like hairdressers go there to buy like new, the new tool that to use a curl hair or whatever, like brands all like showcasing their stuff. It's more like a trade show more than anything. Mm-hmm. But then there's not, that much stuff you need as a barber compared to like a hairstylist so shows instead of being like a trade show started being contests where there would be like barber battles so it's it's a bunch of different categories like who can fade the fastest who can do the most amount of scissor work who can do the best beard so there so you would bring a model and compete and then it would be judges and vote and trophies and money and then brands clipper brands started putting a lot of money into these and now there's even like uh the biggest barbering show in the world is in connecticut every year and they call it the super bowl of barbering it's ten thousand people going there every year to participate and there's contests education huge trade show floor it's it's it's, it's kind of a big big scene now and you can get big, do big money if you get if you get very popular in that industry. Um, they'll pay you thousands and thousands just to go educate on stage at these events. That's insane, dude. That sounds cool. Mm-hmm. That sounds great. I mean, it's like getting sponsored. You get sponsored. It's like being a, an yeah. athlete in a way. Yeah, kinda. yeah. That's it. Well, th- so you just have to learn to like <laughs> to not let that go into your head because a lot of the <laughs> things that became like, like barbering kind of became corny at some point mm-hmm. and now it's kind of like going back to being a bit more like regular not as not as corny as it like because it, it took a, a, a point like a few years ago where everybody looked like they were rappers like every barber wanted to look like they were a rapper a celebrity and or something you know they would show show up to these events like all dressed up in gucci and fucking and like it was just too much like too much yeah now it's it's toned <laughs> it's toned down a little bit but yeah like it, it's it's still a big industry and there's still big egos and and stuff so i'm not part of it as much as i used to now i just show up sometimes to see friends and whatnot but it's a it's still a cool scene for someone who like who thought like barbering like uh, if there's a kid somewhere who thinks barbering is a small small side career whatever it can turn into something big yeah that's that's crazy it sounds like a movie like a fun funny movie or something like is yeah yeah like there could be I don't know. Ben Stiller would be like the guy doing the hair, dude. One hundred percent. Kind of like the Zohan. The Zohan, Zohan but like, Zohan. like, like yeah. yeah, but like a version of like of, of like of the show, Zohan, like the in show the space. Scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That'd be sick. That would. Be I'm, I'm sure they'll come up with it at some point. They're running out of like they do one movie for each each genre of yeah of obsession that people have. So, but I haven't seen a movie on tattooing yet, and there's so much content that you could do on that. There, 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 there has to be a, a like a funny movie of how like tattoo like there's so many tattoo artists that came up with the same way of doing the same exact shit everywhere. Um, I'm sure I'm sure they could do something funny with that too. Yeah, absolutely. So, were you on a reality TV show? yeah i had my own yeah so that that again i feel like every time like there's like something new and it's in the same time timeline so i've been like i was busy from (laughs) like 17 to like 21 i was mad busy in those four years it's when I, i i was booking bands then started playing then started cutting hair and then while I was cutting hair, I opened up uh my first barber shop after like a year or two cutting hair mm-hmm. and um with that barber shop I, I had a client who who became a regular and he became a friend and he worked for a TV production and uh they were working on this uh show called Alpha and it was all about um a bunch of guys like cool young guys who were making a killing in their careers and they were looking for like a uh, like uh, to to have me on board, but be more like the guy who interviews um, everybody. So 
so uh, we did we shot a pilot and for the pilot the first scene where i was home with my brand my my son was just like newborn at that point so it was just me with my newborn my wife and then they were following me into my car and then going to interview people like going to the barbershop first and then cutting like uh like famous entrepreneurs like male entrepreneur young male entrepreneurs in my chair and then asking questions and then when they they pushed that to um to the t to tv different tv channels um one said i'm not so interested in all the interviews i'm interested in this guy like i don't give a shit about the other people is interviewing i want i want to see how a guy who's like 20 something early 20s has bunch of money with a barbershop married a porn star has a kid is living the fucking life i want to know more about this guy so we reshot a different pilot of more of my lifestyle and um they just they just bought it and they did a full season of it so following us kind of like meet the barkers used to do so they did, it was kind of like a french version of meet the barkers if mm-hmm. you will and and we did like one season of that and then the it just the, the tv channel ended up shutting down getting bought out and we just didn't have a new contract that's cool though. That's cool. That's, you know, there's just something about, you know, you, you have a trajectory, you know, there's something about you, you're yeah. a star and people see that yeah. everywhere they go. I see that, man. You, I, Thanks, I love the man. book. I think it's, it's great. Um, I, I noticed something that was a little weird. Um, and I, I marked it. Let me find this spot. Bye bye freedom chapter four. Yeah. So yeah. it starts out, you know, you always you, you started out with, you know, a story or something like that. You're talking about your alarm yeah. clock and the oddball hours or the oddball yeah. like not not setting your alarm at 6:30 but 6:33. Yeah. And yeah, your yeah, yeah. your reasoning for that which was well, maybe you can go into it, but like the reason why I mentioned that, I don't know if it's going to be and it's interesting to anybody else, but for me personally, I was like I do that exact same thing. Oh, do you? Every single alarm I ever set is never on the even amount, like 6.30. It's always like 6.29 or 6.31. It's never on the boom. And yeah, I can't. I just can't. Just I don't know why. My head. I don't know why. Yeah, it fucks with my head, but I don't know why. So like, you kind of gave yeah. it a reason, which yeah. I was like, okay, that's a pretty good reason. Yeah. And But what is it, man? Like... For any, I don't know anybody else out there that does weird stuff like this. I hope you you feel like you're not alone because like I was like, wow, somebody else in the world does something, and yeah. and the fact that you wrote it was was cool. Like you have things in your brain. Do you have to write them down uh, like a sketchbook, like a songwriter does? Because me as a songwriter, I'll have an idea, and if I don't write it down, that idea is gone like a half hour later, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. that was the best song ever, but now it's never going to be thing. So. Damn, I should have wrote that down. So, do you write yeah, your ideas try, down, or yeah? I try to do that. I try to do that, and that's pretty much the approach that I have. And I know that's not the author approach. So, I'm not like I didn't get into authoring by be that going like a lot of guys go to school and they do like like training or like lit- literature or something, and then they learn how to properly write, and then they follow guidelines and rules. And I'm not a guy of rules. I've never been a guy of rules. So, I write books like you would write a song. Like I'll be driving. And then some shit happens or I think of, of something that happened like five years ago because that girl that just crossed the street looks like this ex that I used to have. I'm like, oh, fuck. I never thought about speaking about this, writing about this. So I write a couple of lines and I come, I go back um, whenever I have the time. I, I read back the note and then I start writing. Um, a lot of authors, professional authors, what they do is they, they allow themselves every day a minimum of two to three hours to write. Inspiration or not. They sit down and they're like, I have to write. Mm-hmm. And it might be complete trash or something might be good. And, but I ha- you have to write daily and I, I can't do that. I just, I just, I just don't. Cause for me, if I, what I write has no impact and I'm not passionate by the lines I'm writing, it just doesn't flow. So I, I, I do exactly that. Like the alarm clock story was funny cause I, I started writing that morning. I was alone. One of the rare mornings where my kids were not there, they were with uh, the mom on like a little getaway and I woke up and I looked at my alarm and I was like, why have I been doing this for so fucking long? And I decided to start writing and it just came like this. And it's funny because I have a friend who wrote the book and said, dude, I believe that we do this because we're fucking guys who can't be in a box and we cannot be told like, like if you wake up at 630, if you wake up at 630, it's too like 
you're giving, you know, it's, it's like a box. You're, it's like everybody wakes up at 6.30. I'm not going to fucking wake up at 6.30. I'm working at 6.32. Like, I can't. Like, it's like, it's too conformist to do it like 6.30, 6.35. These numbers, are like, e, like they, it doesn't work. So I was like, oh, I get, I get, I get it. I think, like, it's, it's part of my, and, and it's probably yeah. part of your, li- like, style, too. Like, you have to go, like, like as a black sheep. So it's, you can't go at the same time as everybody else. That actually makes a lot of sense. That makes a ton of sense. It's like a subconscious thing for me. It's, uh, but I also, yeah. I also do think about how my life is different than, you know, the average American that's mm-hmm. living, you know, alongside me because of what yeah. I do. You know, it's like, you know, not that I'm special or whatever, but I just, you know, I, I'm a creative. I write songs. I go out and I perform. And I'm not good at some things that other people are great at, you know, like, I'm not, yeah. you know, whatever, but. Could I be be a hairstylist? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it's we'll art, and that's what I, that's what I figured out, dude. It's it's art. Yeah. Like, um, everything in my life that I've done career wise has always been related to art and being creative. And I noticed that everything that I've been trying, when I tried to take something that I'm passionate and I start being good at, and it's creative, like cutting hair, and I start making it into a business, I start sucking at it. You know, like I'm, I'm a good, I did good moves in business. I've always had partners though, helping me out. Cause when, and, but when I take something and I try to make money out of it instead of, and focusing on making money out of it, mm-hmm. instead of just like doing it and just being full blown creative and full blown passionate by it, it sucks. So I realized I could never work or do anything that isn't art related. Cutting hair was art related. Touring with bands was art related. I do a lot of photography now. Photography is art related, and then writing is art related. I can't do anything else. Like so, I, I guess you're probably the same when it's not. And the podcast is the same. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's art. It's communication. It's art. It's so absolutely. It's, that's all we can. That's all we can do. <laughs> you know, I love I love how the book is like. It's not just some. This is what you do to be a good dad, right? It's mm-hmm. it's a hype machine. It's like I'm hyping you up. I'm giving you a pep talk. I'm letting you know that nothing's perfect but then you give some practical things that you're doing it's not like you should do this but it's something yeah. it, for me it was like i didn't get the feeling of you're telling everybody you should do this but it was more like showing a, a different perspective a different angle yeah. on the average dad book the average this is how you become responsible and, and a good human because it you know it says dad ass but it really should it'd be like human ass you know, because yeah, yeah. really anybody could could read this book and you could replace some of the dad stuff or kid stuff with just life stuff, work, whatever, boss. You can treat people yeah. like your kids in in some ways. You don't yeah. have to treat them like kids. But I guess what I'm yeah. saying is I, I, I got a lot out of the book from being a dad, but but also it's like even if I wasn't a dad, I would I would be feeling good about these messages. So yeah, you know, once you get through Thanks. some of the it's, Yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of like the uh the answer and the response and feedback i've been getting from a lot of people who've read it so far because i've obviously done focus groups before um sending him to the printer my final version you know i've done focus group friends and a bunch of uh like other authors in groups have read the book and got feedback and a lot of girls wrote it they read it and were like you know what like i loved it and they're like i i i'm like how can you even resonate with it like i talk about like so many sex things with exes and shit. I'm like, how, like, are you seeing, like, you're not seeing me as like a pig or some shit. They're like, no. Cause like girls think the same. We're just like, it's just, it's just, I can put myself in your shoes and I can understand completely. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I guess we're, I guess we all go through these emotions and these things, you know? And if you don't do the work, like, like I talk about in the book, like the meditation, the breathing, the mushrooms, I believe everybody should be doing, but I'm not like pushing that in the book too much. I'm just talking a little bit about mushrooms because I think it's like a key element of life. But um, I think, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people can resonate with it. And it's, I, I called it that ass just because it's my situation. And I believe like that's also like one of the things I want to be. Like I want to to have that title for myself that I, I, I chose like, oh, I'm going to be a badass dad. So I'm going to be a dad ass. And that's, that's one of my life missions. So I just, it felt like a, like a good title for it, but you're right. Like it kind of like anybody. Hey, we we can all use, you know, help. And, and I think this book, man, I'm glad you wrote it because I'm glad that you reached out, man, because 
honestly, I, I wouldn't read this book if you, if 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 I just saw it, maybe. But but the fact that I'm okay, I have to read this. I should, I'm talking to this guy on the podcast, but then I read the book and I'm like, holy shit, this is great. You know, this is yeah, this is exactly what I need. I've been I've been thinking about a lot of things. My family's coming back next week, uh, and. I'm going to have to play a lot with my kids. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's, uh, we, we're usually together all the time, but we've just, I've been mm -hmm. working a lot and they've been in Texas. So, so just for this, this season, they've been, been out. But, um, for me, it's just like, okay, this is exactly what I needed alongside all my dad stuff. If I can make it personal, uh, I've been in a, you know, in a, in a season of, of needing to make some changes, personal life changes, health changes, uh, whether it's exercise, the type of exercises that I'm doing, you know, the way I'm eating, like I'm, it's in my head all the time mm -hmm. lately. And all of that, of course, family has a lot to do with that, you know? And so like this book came at a great time. And, and I think, I think awesome. everybody needs, needs a little bit, needs a friend, you know, whether it's, that's a book friend or a real friend, we all need real friends, of course. But yeah. uh, man, I, I just, you know, I hope we can hang sometime and actually like sit down and talk because, because, uh, I really appreciate what you wrote. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate the, the comments and I, I, I totally agree. And also, you know, if I would have never wrote that book, I would have probably never started reading. I'm not a reader. Like I, like the last book I read before like writing this one was like in high school. Mm -hmm. So, but since writing that ass, I've been curious about picking up not self-help books but like some some books out there that i'm like you know what i think i might learn something from this and i would have never done that before so i'm like i'm kind of maybe i'm maybe like you like I ha i'm busy dude i have other shit to do and i'm a creative so like i don't spend that much time consuming other mm -hmm. people's art sometimes because i'm just like so focused on making mine and it's not i don't want to get inspired or whatever but it's also that at the same time i don't want to kill my own vibe so i'm so like sometimes when you you get too much into something you tend to to imitate it or like you know it starts resembling a little bit and i didn't want to do that so i didn't read books prior to that but since then i've been picking up books i i am just reading right now um Aubrey marcus's book and he's talking about you know like like you're saying i'm also trying to become like a better human for myself not for my kids even i'm talking about like health like mm -hmm. um, what i eat what i supplement with and i would have never never went out of my way before writing that ass and try to seek out books to help me get better but after writing the book and seeing how a lot of people give me feedbacks like hey dude like just that one chapter like it, it resonated so much with me and i'm gonna start implementing that or oh i realize i have the same pattern and i need to to fix that shit i'm like okay, maybe I should start reading other people's shit too because there might be useful information in there. So, And it's funny because you said that we um, just connected uh, e like recently and it's it's because of barbering because I would have like, you know, like I, I fell on, on your podcast profile through MRK, shout out Michael. So, Oh, what's up, Michael? And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, like we, I, I it just, he posted like that he was with you. I was like, I've seen that guy before. And then I clicked and I was like, oh shit, yeah, okay. And uh, then fell in the podcast and I was like, oh, like these interviews are cool and the people he's inviting are cool. So that's when I, I reached out. But again, barbering. I met MRK years ago at a barber show. So I, he's in El Paso. I was in Montreal. So we would have never met if it wasn't for the barbering industry. Right. So, uh, it's crazy how like everything has been linking up, up always in my life, like going from barbering to music to barbering to photography to TV and now book. But it just goes like like all the circle keeps being the same people. It's, it's, it's cool. It is kind of amazing. Yeah. I mean, I have friends that are authors I have friends that are musicians, friends that are barbers, you know, you and Mike. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's. It's wild, man. People that are actors, friends that are actors and, and do, do movies and TV, but everybody's just cool, man. Like just being, trying to be creative, trying to do their thing. And I appreciate what you did, man. And I, what's next? You, you're going to write another book? You got an idea or you have uh, business stuff going on before we go? So I'm, I'm going on tour right now. Um, well, as this is going to come out, I'm going to be on tour and I haven't been on tour since music. And when I, when I, the book was finished, I told my wife, I have to go on tour. Like I have to do this for myself. I just feel like when I had a band, I was like, the objective, like, like the, the goal is to go on tour and just play. 
And I'm like, now it's the same thing. The goal is just to go on tour and meet people and, and, and make sure they, they, they know about the book, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm going on tour. I'll be on tour when this drops. And I'm going to be the last day of this tour. I'm starting writing a new book with someone. So it won't be a book about me, but um, it's about, it's kind of like the biography of someone else, mm. but in a different style. Again, like my style is super humoristic and it's not a biography itself. It's, it's a mix. And I'm going to be doing the same thing with this guy. He's like a super interesting guy. I met him only once before and we spoke for like two hours and I couldn't stop thinking about the stories he would tell me. So I was like, you know what? Like I have to write your book, dude. So it took me a few months to convince him, but like uh, last day of this tour, I'm uh, meeting up with him. We're starting the writing process together, so I'm super stoked. That's just wild, and and you really, it's something you've never done before. So you're kind of like you're like, let's just oh, see I've, how it goes. <laughs> and writing something for someone else, even though yeah, it's even like I I even tried to look online and like how do you write a biography for someone else, and uh, everything that I've been reading and watching, I'm like it doesn't. It, this is not how I want to do it. So mm -hmm. I decided like we're gonna rent a podcast studio, sit down together, and talk. And I'm recording everything, and then I'll listen home. And then it'll just flow. It all. It. I don't know how it's gonna come out. If it's gonna come out me talking, like if I was him, or if I'm just gonna be kind of describing the story he told me. But like from my perspective, I have no idea. But I just know it has to be fucking amazing, and it will be because this guy's fucking amazing and has crazy stories. So I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to do it. Right. That sounds great, man. Sounds sounds cool. Uh, Thank where you. can where can people get the book? Where can they find you on the tour or what? You know, online. Amazon. The book is on Amazon, and that's where um, it's self-published. You know, it's a, I, I turned down a publisher's offer for it because it just didn't feel right. Again, system. I just can't be a system. Yeah. I can't be a yeah. sellout for the first <laughs> book. I'm like, you know, I can't. I just can't. I had to do it DIY. So I had to do it. I did it. And for me, the the best way to support me is either buy it on Amazon or Walmart.com okay. because these two are the ones who are pushing me the most right now. So I'm really grateful for that. And um, yeah, the tour, I'm, I'm on my Instagram I'm just stopping in a bunch of cities. I'm meeting people. I'm doing some interviews, podcasts, TV, whatever. And uh, then after that, through social media, at Oliver Cult. Excellent, dude. Man, dude. Well, thanks for your time. I won't take any no, more Thank you it. so much for having me. It was great. Thank you. It was, yeah, it was amazing. And I hope, uh, yeah, I hope we can connect at some point, you know? For and, sure. Uh, I mean, in person, that'd be cool. I'll, I'll go see a show for sure. I haven't, I, I'm pretty sure I saw, I don't know if I missed it or not, but at a festival... I know you were playing, and I don't, I can't remember. Like memory is fucked with with all the years, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the the substance of use. But <laughs> I've seen, I, I've I've been at a festival where I know you guys were playing with no effects, and I can't remember where it was, and I can't remember if I catch the set or not. But like this time, I have next time that you play a fest, I have to go in there, and I'll I'll, I'll go see you there. Yeah, we'll be back around. And anytime you're, if you're in a town that's not obviously Mexico where you live or somewhere, just hit me mm -hmm. up. I'll. Yeah. I'll hook you up. Of course. Awesome. Dude. Awesome. Well, thank you. Ever, thank uh, you so much for having me, man. Absolutely. Appreciate it. And uh, best thank of luck you. to you. Can't wait for uh, for your next book, dude. Thank you. All right. All right, man. Have a good one. Cheers. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I want to thank my guest, Oliver Colt, for taking the time. Um, Dadass is out everywhere in stores. Go check it out. It's you can get it at Amazon, Walmart, a bunch of other places. It's very indie, uh, but it's very mainstream. Like um, I know that it's uh, not for everybody, but a lot of the things he talks about in this book, that's for everybody. Being a good person, being a good human, finding time to do what matters. And um, I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thank you guys for listening. MXPeaks.com. Uh, keep in touch. Make sure you follow the podcast if you want to submit a song for Music Monday. You do that on the Facebook, the Mike Herra uh, podcast Facebook group. And just give me a, a YouTube link there. Um, maybe it's your band or your, your buddy's band or, or whatever, your girlfriend's band. I would love to hear it. And I'm sure that uh, the podcast community would as well. All right. Um, I'm sure there's more that I'm forgetting, but until then, shout out to Bob McKnight for producing. Uh, you know, we love him and he does a, a pretty good job at, at keeping it all together. So much love, Bob. All right, y'all. Peace. <laughs>